Um, so welcome everyone to another uh, monthly session of the University of Idaho, Utah State University, and South Dakota State University Sheep and Goat webinar series. Uh, we're really excited this month to highlight some, some new research and some innovations that we're seeing um, in regards to solar grazing. Um, that's been a huge topic in the industry, it seems like, up and coming across the country. But without further ado, I want to introduce Sir Khan Atesh. He's an associate professor of forage and livestock systems at Oregon State University. Um, and so with that, go ahead and, and take the floor. Thank you, Jalen. And um, it's just really a great honor to uh, join you guys today. And at any stage uh, in the seminar, please feel free to ask questions. Um, I will try to explain um, the acre wall takes today. I'll be uh, probably like, you know, giving some examples from our studies and what we have done, what we'll be doing in terms of agrivoltaics. Hopefully it's gonna be a clear, concise type of presentations, but you know, uh, whenever you want, please feel free to ask questions. Okay. I will start a little bit of introduction about my background. I am originally from Turkey, one of the sheep growing uh, countries in the world. I did my master's in animal nutrition and then I went to New Zealand and um, I did uh, some like, you know, work for this sort of like, you know, the dryland grazing management type of practices uh, for my PhD. Um, that was in 2004 and 2009. And then I joined an international um, agricultural station in the Middle East, uh, which was called ICARDA International Center for Agriculture Research for the Dry, dry Areas. It was one of the 15 institutes across the world uh, that works for uh, the smallholder type of, you know, the farming systems, try to increase the productivity in those like in the systems. And in 2006, I joined my position as the forage livestock system scientist at Oregon State University. I'm the first uh, faculty uh, for that position. And I established uh, the uh, program on, again, like you know, the pasture-based livestock production systems. Um, since then, like you know, I have been working on these type of production, and these are some of my uh, research topics. Basically, I work on pasture chemoscapes, which is really uh, involved in you know the using phytochemicals in plant species and their roles in uh, animal sort of like in the health, uh, reducing of the methane and nitrous oxide emissions in in general. So we have done quite a bit of work on this one, and we have got a strong interest in this type of you know the work. So nowadays, like, you know, not only uh, the United States, but across the world, regenerative grazing system is kind of like really important. And it's just, you know, coming, becoming an important type of, you know, the production systems. So we try to understand the regenerative grazing system as compared to traditional type of pasture production. And let's see if the, you know, the claims fall through. We try to uh, design and uh, conduct experiments on those uh, type of production systems as well. So we have done a couple uh, grazing trials using sheep, uh, basically looking at the pastures and the pollinators. I also like uh, dual purpose systems quite a lot and the byproducts. Uh, we have done quite a bit of work on the uh, hemp related type of work. Um, we looked at the effect of spent hemp biomass feeding with spent hemp biomass, basically the uh, animals and look at the effects of that CBD, THC um, type of deal. And if I'm not wrong, I did the, actually the first study in the world um, in terms of like using spent hemp biomass for the sheep. And we published that one a few years ago. And we did one uh, study with the chicken roots. Uh, in Oregon, we have got a very strong uh, seed industry. And one of those seed companies approached me to look at the chicken roots as kind of like a potential sort of like, you know, the feed ingredient to reduce the parasitic type of, uh, you know, the problems in, in sheep. And we did one study and we are about to write the paper at the moment. My student graduated last year on that one. And today's topic is agrivoltaics. Um, agrivoltaics is becoming an important type of production systems, not only in the United States, but across the world. Um, whenever I visited uh, in the world, they have got a or they are starting an agrivoltaic type of production system. It's kind of like you know the wildfire in the world in terms in terms of like you know 
a grazing system as well. So today I will talk about the uh, AgriVoltex uh, production grazing systems in general, and I'm hoping to give you guys a balanced type of information on that one. So we have done, we have completed a couple studies so far, and then uh, we are really uh, at the moment currently uh, running some trials as well. Again, it's not, uh, it's, it's to me like, you know, again, fair to say that we have done the first ever grazing studies in agrivoltex in the world. And that was basically the comparison of uh, grazing systems in agrivoltex with the open grazing or the traditional grazing practices. And I will talk about the results that we uh, collected from that one. Um, and then the second grazing trial was comparison of different type of pasture types, again, under grazing systems. And we also looked at the uh, potential effect of solar panels on uh, pollinators. Um, I'm not going to talk about that one today, but these solar panels or the agrivoltaics basically can be really an interesting and important type of uh, resources for the pollinators as well. So if there is any question, I'm happy to take those too. So um, we also completed one study on different uh, Pasture establishment practices in agrivoltaic systems because it's important. It's a little bit difficult to establish the pastures in agrivoltaics, and I can talk about that one too. And right now, we are running two studies on evaluation of different forages under various irrigation regimes in agrivoltaics. We have some published papers. If you guys reach out to me, I'm happy to share those ones. And we have got some ongoing trials on these ones too. Okay, so what is agrivoltaics, uh, first of all? In my opinion, agrivoltaic is a fancy name for like you know the producing energy and agricultural like in you know, the products at the same time from the same land. Like I mentioned earlier, it's kind of it's kind of like you know the wildfire in everywhere. Everybody is, has some interest in agrivoltaics in different parts of the world, and they call different names. Some people call uh, call this uh, solar panels, sol solar farming, right? And agrivoltaics is the most common name at the moment. Um, I think it started in Europe uh, because, as we all know, that Europe has a limitation for the land and at the same time the energy production, especially nowadays with the Ukraine and Russian war. So they are really constrained with the energy, like you know, the supply in their countries. And at the same time, the land is quite valuable in Europe. Uh, not a lot of like you know the spaces or the land available for the agricultural production. So they just did a lot of. They have been doing a lot of work uh, to design new agrivoltaic systems, just to provide again the food and energy production from the same land as well. And mostly they use these uh, elevated type of you know the panels uh, in their systems. Um, in the United States as well it's just becoming really an important type of uh, production system it's gaining a lot of tractions um but our system as far as i see is a little bit like traditional type of uh, ground mounted uh, solar panels right so um there are a lot of predictions and trajectories in uh, solar panels establishment in the agricultural fields um Right now, that almost like you know, around about 30% of agrivoltaics or solar panels will be established by 2040. We know that the global warming is a big issue and supplying clean, clean type of energies is really important in that sense. And we don't have actually a lot of uh, opportunities or the options in, in a way to provide, let's say that like, you know, uh, in a way that the clean, clean green energy for the uh, increasing populations, right? So the agrivoltaics in a way that, like I mentioned, is a fancy, sexy name for producing the agricultural productions, whether if it is you know, the crop production or the livestock production in the same land with the energy production as well. Okay, so in theory, so you can produce 100% of crops and animals in an open land, right? You know, that's the potential of the land or the animals. And if you assign uh, the same land to uh, solar panels, you can provide 100% uh, of solar panels. But if you combine in an optimized way, you might be able to like you know, produce both from the same land. And I mean, the productivity of the land will be decreasing a little bit for the crop science, crop production systems, and also for the solar panels as well, or the solar energy standpoint. 
But when you combine the solar energy and the crop production, the overall land use efficiency might be increased. That's just the whole idea about this dual use system in agrivoltaics. Okay. So, uh, like I mentioned, in Europe, it started a little bit with the cropland and elevated type of production systems. But in the United States, most likely the ground-mounted solar panels. And, I mean, I started to work on agrivoltaics around about five years ago. And since then, I've been following up the developments, basically. And it's really like a wildfire in everywhere. And there are so many, like, you know, the different solar panel establishment and, you know, uh, grazing basically incorporated into these places uh, just to make use of the land as well in a better way. And it's just increasing uh, exponentially. Um, if I remember correctly, in Oregon, in the next two years, 5,000 acres of grass seed fields will be covered by the solar panels. That's there. It's becoming an important production system for us as well. So we know that the energy is one of the most constraining type of uh, source for us, sources for us in the world. We need more, ener more energy for the... Uh, like you know, increasing type of uh, production systems. And, you know, at the same time, we need to uh, provide more food for the increasing demand and populations for the, you know, the human beings. So my colleague, Chad Higgins, uh, at the Biolog Biological and Ecological uh, Engineering Department, he's one of the leading scientists in the world, uh, actually, on the agrivoltaic systems. He basically like you know did some studies and he says that um, based on his calculations, if we like you know, to convert one percent of the agricultural land to solar panel sites, this will be enough. Uh, we'll be able to like you know produce enough energy to like you know uh, like you know enough energy for the uh, business and in industry or the public for the world, right? But we know that the populations are increasing at the same time. And so what is the effect on the food production? We need to increase the food production at the same time, right? So what is going to be the effect on it, right? If the food production is going to decrease, increase, you know, because we are mostly like, you know, taking the agricultural land for the uh, solar panels or the Qualtics. And there's a reason, good reason for that one. And I'll talk about that too. Okay. So we'll come Back to that topic, but I wanted to basically uh, talk to you about what is agrivoltaic, you know, how it affects the microclimate type of environment for the agricultural production at the beginning. So in most cases, the agrivoltaics or the solar panels are the ground mounted uh, type of uh, solar panels in the United States. And for the efficiency of the energy production, these are uh, a little bit of tilted in the 20 percent uh, degrees and uh, there is sort of like you know the full shaded type of areas directly under the solar panels and partially shaded areas depending on the season and some open areas as well and the microclimatic type of conditions very uh very quite a lot actually depending on these you know the small uh interesting type of areas in most cases, the partially shaded areas, they retain the soil moisture a little bit long, longer uh, compared to open areas. And soil moisture is really important because water is one of the limiting factors for the plant growth. But most important, the light is the uh, most limiting factor, right? So we have got the full shaded type of areas, no matter uh, the time of the year, and partially shaded areas. And the partially shaded areas depends you know, the uh, the total area depends on the year and then some open areas. And open areas is not sort of like conventional, similar to conventional open areas because of the type and the shape of the solar panels, there is quite a bit of like, you know, the water input in the system too. So there is quite a bit of like in the water logging, water logging effect, especially if it is a high rainfall type of areas. Overall, in a smaller type of areas, there's quite a lot of different microclimate conditions happening, right? And we try to understand these uh, microclimate conditions and how they affect the pasture production in my own sense and, and also like the uh, grazing practices too, okay? So from the energy production standpoint, we know that increases or decreases of the temperature uh, they reduce the efficiency of the solar panels, right? 
for example, if you go to the desert areas, it's a little bit ironic, but if it is too hot, the energy production, energy capture of the solar panels decrease. And the same way, if you go to the, like, you know, the, uh, all the polar areas where there are a lot of, like, you know, snow covers and whatnot, uh, it also, like, you know, the decreases the efficiency of the energy production as well. Wind spent, on the other hand, increases the uh, efficiency of energy production, but humidity decreases the same way. So we kind of like in you know, the work around these different microclimate conditions to be able to define what it really is the best type of potential place and environmental conditions uh, to increase energy production. And we did like, you know, some thermodynamic model applied to globe. And based on this one, like I mentioned, if it is too hot in the tropics or Middle East type of desert systems, the energy production is from the solar panels is not really highly efficient. So the efficient energy production of the solar panels, interestingly, is coming from the temperate agricultural type of areas where we just produce a lot of croplands and the grassland. That's actually uh, is the source of, in a way, the potential and the conflict at the same time. I know that there are very many farmers at the moment, uh, they don't want the agricultural field to go to anything other than agricultural production, which I really understand it's dear to my heart as well. Agricultural fields should be definitely protected and we need to be able to like them produce uh, crop and animal production from those lands, right? But at the same time, we know that the uh, environmental requirements for the solar energy is just very similar to the crop lands. Okay, in terms of the efficiency production. So there's kind of like a, a little bit of like a conflict from that sense. And this also like, you know, brings some potential type of dual purpose use as well. So if we take a look at it, I mean, what is the main limiting factor? We need to think about this one the first for the plants, right? It's just the light. If there is no light, there's no forage production, there's no plant production, there's no crop production. We know that one. But at the same time, the second uh, limiting factor is water. So water is really important, especially if you are in a dryland type of situation, right? You know, it's just a little beer source of commodity. If you have got the water and then the light, you can just produce a lot of uh, crop production or the plant production. But this really, uh, you know, in terms of the solar panels, increasing type of, you know, the water availability and less stress type of plants depends on the uh, design of the solar panels and then depends also like, you know, the plant species that growing in, in shaded type of environment. Historically, there have been a lot of silvopastoral type of production. Uh, people uh, try to... Um, People, uh, people try to uh, grow so many different types of crops and pastures in silvo pastoral uh, productions. And in, in those type of systems, there are like, you know, there's still um, some trades off and uh, complementarities as well. But in silvo pastoral, there haven't been many. And we try to still understand the systems. And I will be talking about the intric uh, intricacies about this, uh, this system as well, as well. So... From the solar energy standpoint, though, um, one of the benefits of the plants under the solar panels, plants transpire, you know, we know that because of the respirations and that has got a cooling effect and that creates kind of like a micro microclimate type of conditions. And then that cooling effect actually increases the energy production potentials of the solar panels. So basically in theory, if you like, you know, establish these solar panels and croplands, it's just really good, right? You know, because the plants basically have got lots of uh, water availability because of less evapotranspirations and, and also like in those shades, just really like this one. Uh, the, the solar panels really like this environment because it just has got a cooling effect, right? In theory, it's just really great. But... This definitely depends on the design of the solar panels and intensity of the shade as far as uh, the agricultural production is concerned. So my colleagues, before I got involved in agrivoltaics, they did some studies and they tried to quantify the forage production and they said, that, okay, you know, from April to August, there's quite a bit of like an increase in forage production because of that available type of moisture, right? And then they said, oh, the forage production increases. 
And then later on, they contacted to me and they said, oh, we are just doing like, you know, these studies. Why don't you like, you know, to take a look at the grazing management and then the pasture production a little bit like you know, intensively. And I said, that's just really a good idea. And I looked at the uh, forage production and, and also like, you know, the livestock production in these agrovoltaic systems. And and in my opinion, it's not my, you know, the opinion uh, only. I mean, it's just the science basically like the most limiting factor for the uh, pasture production is the light. For the plant production, whether it is like, you know, the potatoes, wheat or whatever, it is just the light, right? Jalen, I think that there is a question and I will stop in here if you can ask. Yeah, so the, the question is, so before you switch over to pastures, um, how do you harvest crops if the solar panels are on top of them? Fantastic. It's a good question. So like I mentioned, in Europe, they mostly use the elevated type of uh, panels. So in elevated type of panels, you can grow almost anything because you can put the agricultural machineries under the solar panels, right? You can put a tractor, combine, combine whatever so in that case you can grow potatoes you can grow wheat you can grow cotton whatever you want it to grow so that's not a big problem but elevating the solar panels from the solar developer standpoint is expensive because the most expensive believe it or not the most expensive part of the solar panels is the tools that they use because it's still it still is becoming expensive and I'm working uh, with so many different solar developers at the moment, and they, they are trying to find alternative type of uh, systems that will uh, reduce the cost on that one. That's not a problem. But if it is ground mounted solar panels, you can only be able to like, you know, till and plant so, uh, any type of, you know, the crops in between the solar and uh, panels in solar arrays. That, that's what they call it. Okay. And I will get back to that po uh, point again, you know, when I explain how we establish our, our pastures. Okay. If it is, in, in short, if it is ground mounted solar panels, you can only be able to, you, like, you know, the, uh, till the uh, soil and plant something in between solar panels, not under the solar panels. And that's a big limitation. But if it is elevated solar panels, in most cases, you should be able to, like, you know, the plant under the solar panels as well. Having said that, it has other limitations uh, for the production aside from the establishment techniques and methods. Okay. So, uh, like I said, I mean, my colleagues contacted to me and I said, this is just really an interesting type of production system. Let's try to understand what's happening uh, for the herbage production and the forest production, right? And we designed several types of productions, like in, in terms of the uh, animal production, grazing management practices. So the first one is was very simple, actually. We wanted to see what happens to herbage production and also the sheep production, you know, in under the solar panels or in open areas, right? And we designed a replicated multiple type of uh, replicas, replicates under solar panels in open areas. And we wanted to have a direct comparison of pasture production and herbage production in agrovoltaic sites, right? So in this picture, you see that one of our blocks, one of our replicates, the lambs under the solar panels in open areas. And we basically, like, you know, looking at the forage production, we uh, calculated carrying capacity, soaking rates, and uh, put the lambs in early spring. And we did this one in 2019 and 2020. And we grazed with wind lambs for about, like, you know, the three months. And we looked at the herbage production through the cage cuts and look at the forage quality, uh, collected a lot of samples, monitor the forages throughout the grazing seasons and whatnot. And we weight the lambs, uh, basically monitor their live weight gains and everything. Aside from that, we also wanted to look at the foraging behavior of these animals and the welfare type of, you know, the aspect because, you know, the one of the claims of agrovoltaics, the, uh, it's, it's just a better environment for the animals because of the shade uh, availability, right? So we did all of this, those things in our first trial. And I wanted to show you these four pictures and how seasonal uh, outlook of these uh, agrovoltaics, right? In winter, if you are grazing, putting animals dry use, for example, they graze the agrovoltaic sites. And in most cases, they really like to stick under the solar panels. It's just like another you know, no wonder, right? 
it is because of the cold weather and rain wall, rainfall and everything. So they like to stick under the solar panels a lot. And this has got a negative effect on the forages or the pastures because there's a lot of trampling type of effect, right? And in early spring, what happens is uh, there are a lot of annual weeds and grasses just grow under the solar panels and in open areas, basically like, you know, the ordinary type of pastures, the forages grow. And in summer, because of the evapotranspiration, uh, the soil moisture dries out quite quickly in the open areas, but there's still a little bit of availability under the solar panels because of the moisture retained in those places. And in fall, since the rainfall comes in these open areas the first, basically there is a very quick, you know, the forage growth. But look at the under the solar panels, what it happens. Because the soil uh, moisture is still low and soils are still very dry because the panels prevent the soil like you know moisture increase because of the rainfall right so these are still dry areas and there is a little bit of dry uh delay in uh the production of the forages so basically uh when once we look at this system there are three or four different type of zones or rows right directly under the solar panels there is one area sort of like you know the lower light availability and a little bit of sort of like increased uh water moisture retention throughout the summer period of time and partially shaded areas as well uh throughout the year in different seasons um the partial shade changes uh basically because of the season and the site uh the position of the sun right and uh because of the solar panels they dump a lot of water into these, you know, the partially open areas, there's another like in the area, which is open, but at the same time receives a lot of water too. So they are a little, a little bit of different from the rest of the places as well from that sense. But in general, uh, these um, solar panels, under the solar panels, right beneath the solar panel areas, there's a little bit of like, you know, the more moisture available, which is no wonder because of the uh, lower evapotranspiration, right? but the temperature also is a little bit lower. So we try to really understand these microclimatic type of you know, conditions under solar panels and try to make sense of these, um, of these uh, like, you know, different conditions and what we can grow the best in, in these different type of really areas. Uh, Jalen, I see another question related to the goats. We, I will come back to that point really at the end of the presentations, but, but I can, uh, very quickly mention about different classes of animals. We thought about the pigs, we thought about the chickens and the goats, and even cattle in, in these systems. But at the moment, like in the, if it's a ground mounted type of solar panels, the sheep is the best animal because the goats can climb up to the solar panels and they can create a lot of like, you know, the trouble uh, or the damage that they may be able to like, you know, achieve the cables and, and all, all, all kind of like, you know, the different things. And the, for the chickens, it's the same thing. They can just fly over the solar panels. They can, you know, the pro, like, you know, left their droppings and things like that, right? So as far as the uh, ground mounted solar panels right now, she, uh, the sheep is the best animal. I have been thinking about the pig productions, especially the organic type of like in the pigs, because it might be really important because the pigs really um, need a lot of like, you know, the shade as well. But pig is a different type of an animal in terms of the grazing management. And I don't have personally have a lot of experience, but, you know, there might be other type of animals, but the sheep is the easiest one to answer this question, that question very quickly. Okay. So, and my colleagues, before I uh, joined these agrivoltaics type of work, they looked at the uh, forage production and they said, okay, if you basically look at the forage production from sort of like, you know, the June to August, you can increase a lot of forage production, right? You know, almost 300 person. And I said, yes, this might be true, but forage production is not only like, you know, the in summer, right? You know, we need to take a look at the throughout the seasons. So in their first study, basically when they looked at the uh, forage production in summer, there was a lot of like an increase in forage production under the solar panels. But I said, we need to do this one throughout the year. What's happening? And I basically uh, quantified the forage production under the fully shaded areas directly beneath the solar panels and partially shaded areas in open areas. 
And what happens is in basically spring period of time, the solar, uh, the pasture production is the highest in open areas. And this is followed by the partially shaded areas. But when it comes to sort of like in you know, the summer times, the forest production really increases under the solar panels and in partially shaded areas, which is like on you know, the no-brainer like, because of the retention of the soil moisture. But when you you know look at the accumulated total forest production throughout the entire year and add everything up, all the harvest, you know, the together. Basically, the solar pastures, which is like you know, the pastures under the solar panels or in you know, agrivoltaic type of systems, it's almost 40% less. And there's a lot of like, you know, the decrease in pasture production. Okay. So that was our like, you know, the first uh, outcome of the pasture production. No matter like, you know, who says and what about the agrivoltaic systems. In ground mounted solar panels, I can guarantee that the pasture production will be decreasing because of the shade effect. Okay, that's number one. And we also look at the uh, sheep production in spring. Basically, this was the wheat lambs, and wheat lambs didn't differ so much uh, in early spring because the forage production was high in open and agrivoltaic sites, as you guys can see it. And the uh, sheep production, live weight gains, basically in the later in the spring decrease a lot. The snow brainer too. It's all almost like you know the same case for open pastures, but there was almost like you know the no difference between open and agrivolt or agrivoltaic type of uh, systems at all. And we did the studies for two years, it, and and then the results were really consistent. Um, it is interesting that the uh, flourish production under the solar panels were lower than the open areas. Like I mentioned before, right? You know, there's this 40% decrease in the flourish production. But the thing is, uh, the quality of the pastures under the solar panels were a little bit like in you know, the higher because in the outside areas, open pastures, the plants wanted to like you know, go to seeds quite immediately. So it wasn't the case under the solar panels. So the seed heads, development delayed quite a bit off and then the production and then production was low but the quality of the forages were like in the higher under the solar panels and another important factor is especially when it comes to summer the animals they have to uh, like you know allocate quite a bit of energy to regulate their body temperatures imagine that in a sheep or cattle or whatnot any different type of classes of animals if you are like you know grazing under open areas, basically, like you know, you need to spend a lot of energy to cool down your body temperature, right? This definitely wasn't the case in the solar panels, right? And animals like you know take the advantage of the shade. And in my opinion, they didn't need to spend a lot of energy to maintain their body temperatures. I think that has a lot of effect why they had similar type of live weight gains and live weight production overall in the system, right? And it was really consistent in both years. So we also look at the water consumptions because water is really a limiting type of factor in dryland type of conditions. In early spring, when the forest had a lot of water and then the temperatures weren't really high, there was absolutely no difference. But in the second part of the year, the animals under the solar panels, they definitely needed less water, which was a really uh, good type of outcome, but it wasn't consistent across the year. This probably like, you know, depends on the amount of rainfall that you receive, right? In some year, you might be able to like, you know, get a little bit more rainfall. In some years, they might be a little bit less and some springs are cooler than the others, right? But if you are in a dryland type of environment, I think that the water consumptions of the animals under the solar panels would be less. It's it's probably like another you know, fair to say that one. So we looked at the land equivalent ratio in this study. So what it means for the herbage production, what it means for the live weight uh, gains of the animals. So overall, we found out that the herbage production and then the solar energy production in the same line increases the land use efficiency because if you only like you know, to produce energy that is like in you know, the one unit if you produce the pasture production it's just the one unit but if you combine them it's going to be a little bit less like i mentioned in the beginning of my lecture but you know overall it increases the uh, land use efficiency 
And for live weight gain production standpoint, it's a little better because the animals like the shade, right? Okay, this was the outcome of first study, but this first study was basically done in only like in the open area, uh, in um, agrivoltex and open areas, in on, only in spring period, not in summer, not in fall, right? So we thought that the lower herbage mass available in solar pastures uh, because of the light limitation was offset by the higher forage quality and probably the animals, again, spending less energy for the maintenance to cool down their body temperatures. And the shade basically provides more animal welfare, welfare friendly environment because of the shade and under suns and rainfall type of conditions too. And we thought that the land productivity can be increased quite a lot. and. The one uh, thing outside the uh, the one thing that we get out of this study was that the study was done in an old uh, grass dominated type of weeded pastures, and we basically like you know didn't plant anything in particular aside from like you know the overseeding. So we didn't know what it would have happened if we improve the pasture production in both uh, cases. There is one question right now: Might it be a good idea to put a single drip irrigation tubes? Okay, I will go, come to the uh, irrigation standpoint, Rog. So uh, I'll just answer your questions later on. But right now, we are all doing our studies in rainfall type of station, right? Rain fed type of environment. And in our first study, it was unimproved type of pastures in open areas in agrovoltaics. We said, okay, what happens if we just can plant something in between the solar arrays? and try to improve the pasture production, what happens really in, in that case? So we uh, we designed uh, three different pasture mixtures. In one case, like you know, the simple grass clover type of pastures, in another way, diverse, uh, including the pasture, like in you know, the grasses, legumes, and forbs, uh, non-leguminous type of forms. And in one case, we said that, okay, what happens in the legumes? Legumes are really important because they promote the animal production really high, and at the same time, they can be really useful for the pollinators. This was our idea, okay, in this study. And what we did was, like, you know, they established the pastures in fall 2020, but we were able to, like, you know, put the tractors in between the solar areas, not directly under the solar areas, it's not rainy, right? And in these areas, we really had a very beautiful pasture establishment. Our legumes and grasses and diverse pastures established were established really well. And we started the grazing in 2021 and we continued in spring 2022. I apologize for this table, it's a little bit like you know, the crowded. You guys see here the sown pastures. Sown pastures are the forage production only in between solar areas not directly under the solar panels where we cannot plant anything. And agrivoltaic pastures are, if we just take into account of the forage production directly under the solar panels where we couldn't plant anything, but there are a lot of like you know, the annual grasses, right? So what we saw that one simple pasture mixtures and diverse pasture mixtures are very similar, but the legumes definitely are lower. And if you just put the agrivoltaics, it's a little bit similar, but since you cannot plant anything under the solar panels, the production decreases quite a lot. So that's just like in the sense of the entire like you know the field, right? So this is the production in the entire like you know the uh, agrivoltaic systems under the solar panels in between the solar panels. It's just really diff uh, low. We also looked at separately what is happening in the open areas and partially shaded areas and polish full shade areas. The open areas definitely produces the higher forage production, the partial shade decreases, and there's a really strong reason for that one, and I will come to, come to that point. And then the full shaded areas, this is unsown areas with lots of like, you know, the annual weeds. There is, oh, I, I think that I answered this question, okay. So this is what happens, and it was really consistent across both years, right? Um, in most cases, outside these agrivoltaic site, I get seven to ten, ten like you know, tons of forage. But these are metric units, by the way. Ten tons of like you know, the forage production per hectare. It's very similar to uh, tons per acre standpoint. Only ten percent of the difference. If you just like you know, wanted to do the math. So nonetheless, the production decreases in this agrivoltaic uh, type of systems in terms of the forage production. 
I wanted to show this like in you know, the seasonal distribution because it's really important. Spring, summer, and fall. This was from the first year. Look at the open areas. It's close to 6,000, but partially shaded areas, even partially shaded areas decrease uh, the uh, decreases the forage production, but the full shaded areas where you cannot plant anything, it's just even lower, right? And this was the same for all these different grass clover, diverse herbalay, and or or like like the legume pastures, right? There is a big uh, reason for that one, which is light limitation. So these are the mean pasture growth rates on a daily basis. How much pasture was growing in these different areas? Look at these like in other areas. For simple, diverse, and legume pastures, it was really high in early spring. Legumes were a little lower, which is not a you know surprise because legumes in general, they need to fix the nitrogen in the system, right? And we know that nothing is free in this world. If they wanted to fix the nitrogen, they need to spend quite a lot of energy for the nitrogen fixation, right? So because of that reason, the legumes produce less Forage promise pro production as compared to uh, grasses and diverse pastures or whatnot. But the black colors uh, in this one um, denotes to uh, shaded areas. And in early spring, particularly, they have that lower type of you know, the production in these areas. Okay. In summer, they have got a little bit higher production because of the retained energy, uh, retained, sorry, uh, the water production. But overall, when we looked at this one, again, it was exactly the same. There was 30 and 40% decrease in the forage production on an annual basis. This graph is quite busy. I am aware of that one. The first one is for the grasses. The second one is for the diverse pastures. And then the third one is the legume pastures. But what I want you guys to take a note on this one is just the uh, like these black color. Black color indicates that the weeds, annual weeds in this case, and we had a lot of problems, annual grasses, no matter where you are, no matter what the pasture types, there were a lot of like you know, the annual grasses coming out in the agrovoltaic systems, and it was worse for the legume pastures, okay? These green colors indicates a little bit about the diversity. If you include the plantain, chicory, those type of, you know, the forbs, you can definitely increase those like, you know, the plants in the system, and I would definitely recommend to inc in include uh, those in your pasture type of, you know, uh, mixtures as well. But the weeds were a lot of, like, you know, the problem, especially the um, the thistles. We had to eliminate a lot of thistles, but the annual grasses was just really big. And imagine that these legume pastures, we were able to, like, you know, spray the, spray the uh, grasses, but they came back really, like, you know, really uh, strongly. So for the animal production, the lamb growth rates were similar in most cases, but higher in the uh, legume and diverse pastures definitely promoted the lamb live weight gains. So it was really good, good from that sense. And these 200, 225 uh, grams per day is really good um, lamb growth rates for the wind animals. And this was the first year, the first table and the second uh like in the roses and the second year second year was it was just really a down for it was very wet and cold spring and i assume that that was just really related to that cold uh, spring conditions that the live weight gains of the animals decreased down a little bit but nonetheless it was kind of like the similar trend right you know the diversification helps increasing the lamb production and the leggings were better and basically the live weight production from that sense, uh, which is kilogram of forage production uh, in the entire areas were like, you know, the, uh, similar to the lamb live weight gains. One thing in the second uh, grazing trial where we looked at the spring, summer and fall production, it was just really interesting that the fall product, uh, sorry, summer production, in especially the first year, I must tell you that there was absolutely nothing available outside uh, in the open pastures in July. And this picture I took in July, and there were still like, you know, some forages available in the agrovoltaics, uh, like, you know, production because of that shade effect, because of that retained moisture, there was like, you know, more, definitely for more, more forage production in the agrovoltaics. And we were able to graze these pastures three more weeks in summer where there was absolutely nothing available in the, uh, uh, open areas. So what we 
like you know, got out of this uh, trial overall grass and diverse or hair relay postures were more productive than persistent legumes and it's no brainer because the legumes have to fix nitrogen and the grazing postures for a period of three weeks uh, in summer was the highlight of this trial but we still think that the optimization of the ground mounted photovoltaics panels is really needed for the increased forage production for sure but we don't know what happens to the energy production from that sense so I designed this uh, infographic to show what happens really under the solar panels. Basically, the light limitation reduces the forage production because the light is the most important. And then it comes water and nitrogen. And sometimes the nitrogen might be more important depending on how much water you have in the systems. But definitely light is the most limiting factor. In partially shaded areas in spring, because of the shade, the forage production decreases. And this is the time that you can produce a lot of like in the forages. And in summer, the forage production basically a little bit higher in the partially shaded areas than the open areas and some like you know, sometimes similar. And photovoltaic panels change the distribution of the rainfalls because there's quite a lot of like in the water just in the falls in these open areas right in here. And the four panel structure provides favorable environment for the sheep, but not only for the sheep. We saw that a lot of like you know, the wasps and you know moles and walls and a lot of like you know, the field mice as well. And uh, sheep really likes to stay under the solar panels if they are uh, ruminating or resting under the solar panels. This has got some positive effects for the sheep, but at the same time they put a lot of nitrogen through urinating and providing like, you know, the dungs in these areas. And uh, that just basically causes the fertility, the uh, fertility, like, you know, uh, removal, removal from highly efficient type of forage production areas, the less forage production areas, less favorable areas for the forage production. Partially shaded areas provide similar or slightly higher forage production in summer. And while the areas directly under agrivoltaic panels provide herbage in summer, overall the uh, uh, forage production decreases a lot. Okay, these are mainly what we like you know, to come out with uh, is our like you know the outcomes uh, in these type of like you know the trials. But uh, these agrivoltaic sites cannot be considered like you know the in a usual type of field, right? Basically, we think that these agrivoltaic sites can be really useful in summer where the like you know, the shade is really needed for the animals. Basically, you can uh, plant uh, forage production for summer and this can be like you know, the, utilized as the um, sort of like you know, the foodscape type of areas, uh, sort of like stockpile, like in you know, the forage for summer. Or you can consider these areas for uh, what I call it chemoscapes. You can plant a lot of different types of forbs uh, with uh, medicinal type of properties or the properties that would decrease the uh, methane emissions and nitrous oxide emissions. It might be really a good area for that one. And also, like, you know, the more importantly, in early spring, if you wanted to do the lambing under the solar panels, it's just the perfect site because these solar panels are fenced out uh, and they are protected from all those predators like in the wolves and coyotes and eagles and whatnot that might be an option as well so we are working with different type of solar companies at the moment and they are trying to like you know they elevate the solar panels trying to uh, again optimize the systems and in the future we'll be i'm sure that we'll be seeing more and more this elevated type of solar panels that are more optimized for the animal production or the crop production and at, and at the same time energy production from the same land we are basically running new trials we continue to understand the systems and provide like you know the information and data from these uh, places we are basically now uh working on our new solar farms where the uh, solar panels are a little bit spaced out and sort of like, you know, the rotating uh, because of the sun's uh, movement in different seasons, which is also good for the plants. We are just like, you know, the screening different type of pasture species under the solar panels and in the irrigated conditions and rain fed type of conditions. We are looking at the different establishment uh, uh, methods uh, because they're putting the tractors in different like you know, the uh, agricultural 
equipment is tough. So we are just uh, looking at the alternative type of uh, methods. And we will be like, you know, looking at the different classes of animals like cattle. And we are also like, you know, trying to understand the dual proposed systems like them to have a, what about like, you know, the plant uh, forages for both sheep and uh, pollinators and things like that. So this is pretty much uh, what I can tell you about in this, uh, in this uh, seminar. And I think that we have some time to take questions. So there is a question right now uh, says that is 18 degrees the best slope for the PV? I thought you should match the latitude. This is just definitely a very good question. And in, I'm, I'm entirely sure that in different parts of the world, the degree or the angle of the, uh, basically the solar panels is specifically adjusted based on the solar, you know, the uh, location of the sun or the position of the sun but not really related to the posture of the crop production. That's just a big problem. I really wanted to give you guys a sort of like a balanced type of information. In some cases, uh, yes, agrivoltaics can be a really great type of production, but especially in the United States, the way I see it, most like the, the solar, like, you know, the developers, they wanted to take advantage of this agrivoltaic type of production systems. They wanted to put their solar panels wherever they wanted to. And they are saying that, oh, we are not just like, you know, only producing energy, but at the same time, like, you know, the look, people can see, uh, can put the animals and graze and everything, but they are like, you know, the, their main focus is still the solar panels, solar energy, not the, like, in you know, the agricultural production. In my opinion, it has to be optimized if it makes the economic sense. Not only from the economic sense, though, because I know, like, in the, we need the energy production for the increasing populations, but what about the food? Can we like you know, afford to take this land from the agricultural production and assign to the energy production only? We don't. So we have to optimize the system, but I'm not sure about the economic outcome of these optimized systems for sure. Okay. And if any of you wanted to get the uh, papers that we uh, like, you know, got out of these trials, please feel free to contact me. Okay, I'm happy to share the papers, information, and call me, like, you know, send me emails. I'm generally quite responsive, sometimes, you know, in the evenings, sometimes at the weekends, but, you know, I, I mostly respond to my emails, okay? Do you mind if I put your email in the Q&A? Do this, uh, Jaylene, and, and, and like I said, I'm happy to, like, and reach out to, to people if they have got any questions. I'm happy to answer the questions. Okay, and I can even like you know put you guys in contact with Chad. Chad uh, is a colleague in biological and eco in ecological engineering department. He's an engineer. He is the mastermind behind these agrovoltaic systems. One of the leading scientists in the world, I must say. I mean, in Oregon, we do work a lot on these agrovoltaic systems, and it is not like you know the boasting or bragging. Please don't get me wrong, but we happen to basically conduct the first two grazing trials in the agrovoltaics, so there is not like you know, much available information. So I'm really happy to share those like you know, the informations uh, with you guys. And if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm happy to like you know, answer those. Can you touch a little bit on your findings in regards to the pollinators and how these systems affect pollinators? Pollinators is really interesting, Jaylene. I mean, uh, my colleague, uh, Maggie Graham, did that one. And she was a fantastic master student before that I was involved in her committee. And what we found out that the uh, if you plant the pollinator type of mixtures in the solar panels, the flowering delays a little bit, like, you know, because the plants basically have more moistures and they said, oh, I'm not going to die really quickly so I can delay the, like, you know, the flowering a little bit. So the delay in the blooming, it just really helps the pollinators, right? Because the most limiting time for the pollinators in, in terms of accessing the nectar, like, you know, the sources in July and August, which is really good. So the main outcome of her study was the blooming delays under the solar panels and the bees basically do not mind going under the solar panels to access to those nectars. And it was just really a really a great outcome. 
And I think that uh, protecting the native type of forage spaces or the plant spaces or the pollinator benefits, these agrovoltaic sites can be really good. But like I said, I mean, there are so many unknowns because not only the livestock, not only the plants, but the wildlife in most cases like this, you know, the, you know, the walls and moles. And these places, since they are protected, they might be a breeding grounds for the walls and how it affects the agricultural fields outside the agrovoltaic sites, we don't know it. And then the wasps and the bees, and they really like it. And we have oftentimes, like, you know, see a lot of, you know, the birds, you know, uh, establish their nests under the solar panels, which is really, I'm interested in uh, doing some study on that wildlife too. So I'll probably like to you know, reach out to some colleagues on that one. Okay. There was another question on, has there been any work on making movable solar, like on top yes. of animal shelters, hay wagons, movable chicken coops? Yes, that's actually, to be honest with you guys, being done in uh, the Europe, in Holland in particular, because if you wanted to do anything extra, you increase the cost of establishment of the solar panels. For the United States, we I understand that have a lot of land, but not in Europe. They just try to do a lot of like in you know, the movable type of like you know the rain shelter and then the solar panels at the same time. Yes, they are doing that one in um uh, like you know for the production of the uh blueberries and raspberries, like those type of like you know the crops and maybe sometimes like in the vineyards. And we are also like, you know, trying to, some of our colleagues at OSG are trying to do work on those ones as well, right? But I know that the cost increases a lot. It makes, it needs to make economic sense for that sense. Yeah, absolutely. So there's another one um, that says, so we know that Oregon gets a lot of moisture um, in other places where we're maybe at a high elevation and over 20 inches of precip, how would you approach maybe managing some of those different climates and these Absolutely. solar? Absolutely, this is a very important question. What I thought about it in the dryland type of environment, the agrovoltics must be much more important in than, than the wet areas because of that retained moisture under the solar panels. No matter where you go, the light will be the main limiting factor, right? But at the same time, the second most limiting factor, especially like, you know, the dryland environment, it's going to be the water. If you retain the water under the partially shaded areas or solar panels, it's going to be really important, especially for late spring and summer. So you might be able to like, you know, produce more forage for sure. And in early spring, maybe the forage production may not decrease as much as we have seen in our, like, you know, the forages uh, in Oregon. I believe that these agrovoltaic systems, it might be more important in sort of like in the semi arid and arid areas from that sense. And you know, even for the animals, like in, even when you think about their uh, water consumption, right? In summer, if it is really hot, they definitely wanted to like, you know, stick uh, together under the solar panels as well. And the other important factor is the plants that you can grow under the solar panels. It may differ in different type of like in the areas. And in my next study, I wanted to like you know, explore the options of sort of like you know the planting different pasture mixtures in under the solar panels in partially shaded areas in open areas based on the needs of the plants. Okay, if you can do that one from the plant size side, at least you know we can optimize the system, right? So there are like you know the plants that are more shade tolerant. What happens if we like you know plant those only under the shade, right, as compared to open areas? That's a very good, good question. I mean, Oregon, as you guys know, that especially the Western Oregon, we have got high rainfall areas. In different parts of the world, definitely the microclimate environment will be different. So the importance of uh, solar panels will be different. And Colorado, I know that a lot of like, you know, the really highly intelligent scientists and then the farmers really, in a way the farmers are doing work and I am following on LinkedIn, it's just brilliant. Like I said, I mean, in the future, we definitely need to pro provide clean, green, green energy for the public. We also need to, like, you know, provide the uh, animal and then the feed, uh, food production for the, you know, the human beings, increasing populations. And an optimized agrovoltaic possibly can provide both, but we need to still understand the systems better 
and we need to like you know to optimize the system better Do you know of any resources or trainings available for solar installers on ideal spacing and measurements um, and for farmers to continue to use standard farm equipment and things like what are some are there any resources I guess available to help kind of facilitate those conversations? Yes, uh, definitely. I mean, we have been working with solar developers and many sol solar de developers contacted to us and they said, that, oh, we have got this idea, their idea, like you know, to optimize the system and elevation of the solar panels. And one, actually, solar developers, basically, they try to connect the solar panels with each other using the hooks rather than like you know, putting a lot of like you know, infrastructure for the poles like in the because of poles require a lot of steel so that increases the uh cost of uh solar established solar uh, panel establishment right so we have been working on those ones i must confess that i'm not an engineer i don't know so much about those like you know uh, solar panel side of it but there are a lot of like you know solar panels they are trying to like you know come up with ideas innovative type of ideas that like, you know, they increase the forage production, crop production, and, and at the same time, the energy production from the same land. If you guys connect to me, if you guys send me an email, I'm definitely happy to connect to those, connect you guys with those uh, innovative type of solar uh, people, solar developers, so you can get more information. And Chad, Chad Higgins, don't forget this name, He's in the biological and ecological engineering department. I'm happy to put you in contact with him as well. He's the engineer and he can provide you more information on this uh, solar energy part of the uh, the production. Um, so there's another one here that says, I can see people in ag being interested in exploiting this, but I have heard of companies who have the solar farms prefer to eliminate all vegetation under the solar panels because they think having any plant material is a fire hazard. So how, I guess, what are kind of your recommendations for us as sheep producers to have those conversations with solar companies to include ag on their solar farms? If any of those solar developers, they wanted to establish their solar panels in agricultural type of fields, whether intentionally, like, you know, those some, somebody, like, you know, comes and establishes pastures or, like, you know, the native vegetations under the solar panels, they have to manage those fields. And the options are either applying herbicides, mowing them, or grazing them. Those three, like, in the options available. Herbicide, nobody likes likes at it because, you know, the excess of herbicide is not, like, you know, the good and mowing costs like you know the labor and you know the energy and all kind of like things and grazing is the best option right you know the so far that we know so all those like you know communications with the solar developers in my opinion that involve a sheep grazer especially and in the united states that's what i like this country a lot because if there's an an opportunity there's a business around that one and this that's mainly like you know why the solar like you know the grazing association like you know they happened. There are a lot of like you know solar grazings and it might provide a lot of uh, good alternative for the sheep producers as well. So there are these three options available in my opinion. The best is like you know the grazing these fields, and solar developers have to definitely like you know talk to uh, grazers on that side. This next question is, would you recommend farms putting solar on their barns versus having solar panels on the ground if that's an option? Absolutely. I mean, that should be, in my opinion, the first option. But here is the deal. Solar developers, the cheapest and the easiest way for them to put these solar panels are on the agricultural fields. They can just you know cover a lot of areas, okay, and it's just cheaper for them. That's kind of like the deal, right? So that's why it tend to they tend to like you know to put their solar panels in open areas. But for me, like you know, putting on the barns, you know, the human like you know the houses basically are roofs. It should be the priority. 
But at the beginning of my uh, seminar, I mentioned that like you know, putting these solar panels, let's say that in comparison to a parking lot, it is better for them to put in the agrivoltaic like agricultural areas because the pastures and the forages provide sort of like you know, that cooling effect and the efficiency of the energy energy increases for them, right? So my main like you know uh, recommendations would be basically. If it is optimized for agricultural production and energy production, yes, you put them on the agricultural areas. It is good for the animals. It's good for the energy production. But if it is not optimized, if it is for only the energy production, be careful here that because we definitely need to increase our food production for the human beings as well, not only the energy production, right? So be careful about that one. And if you wanted to put it in the agricultural fields, try to optimize the system. But if it is on the roofs and you know the different plants and everything, it's just perfect to find. Um, did you in your studies find any negative health effects um, for sheep on solar systems? So far, no negative health effect for sure. It's just all positive for the sheep in terms of the welfare or the or the health health effect of the animals. We collected a lot of blood samples and we looked at the animal behavior. They definitely like the shade. But you got to be careful if you have got any of those, like, you know, the wheat uh, species like tansy or, you know, the hemlock. If they come up under the solar panels, it might be an issue. We had mostly the thistles and we cleared this with the mechanical type of, you know, my students did quite a lot of work on cleaning the thistles under the solar panels. But we definitely didn't have any issues with the, um, like you know, th uh, hemlock or fences that 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 would just like you know, cause any problems in the animals. In different parts of the world, it might be a problem. Shade like nightshade. Look at nightshade, for example, is a weed. If it comes under the solar panels, it's a problem, right? So be careful in that one. You definitely need to be aware of it. But for us, we haven't had any issues with those of uh, like in the weeds or um plant species that can cause antinutrient type of like the effects on animals um this next one is about we have some south and southeast facing unusable slopes um are those good places for solar panels i don't know this i mean right away i'm not a solar developer where is the best place to put the solar panels I don't know this. It has to be really related to the position of the sun in different places. If there is an option like that one, Rock, I definitely recommend you to talk to a solar panel developer. Okay, not me, because I I can only like you know talk about the plants. Um, there's a question here about electric fencing. How did um, on your studies, was there permanent fencing or do you did you use electric fencing? I used electric fencing, different types. I used the uh, poly wire in one cases, it worked okay. And I used the flex in it in another case, it worked just fine. So dividing these panel uh, areas under the solar panels with fences, it's not a big problem. You can do it. And I did it. But my grazing studies, they were just mostly continuous grazing studies. And in my next grazing studies, I definitely wanted to use the uh, rotational grazing studies, partitioning the field in different places. And I assume that the forage production will be better under the rotational grazing system. Um, but fencing is not a big issue. In in my, like, you know, the first try, I actually, like, you know, talk to the sheep farmers. I get their like you know the opinion and one of the sheep farmers uh, that I collaborate with, she he gave me a really a good uh, idea, and we established the like you know poly wires and it worked really well. In the second study that I did, I used the flex in it and it just worked okay as well. Awesome. Well, I think that looks like um, the end of our our questions today. We. Thank you so much, Dr. Attes, for your insights. I think this was extremely valuable. Um, it's been something that we've seen growing. Um, 